like your haircut, man. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to talk about my my lack of a great haircut. It's uh, June 10th, 2021. Welcome aboard. This is the Crushing Iron Podcast, yeah. episode 485. See, that's just one of the reasons I don't recommend my salon to my <laughs> friends. Dude, I'm telling you, it's, I'm going to go into this it in a minute. It's like long time bitterness. Here. I, there is. This is probably gonna, it's going to end our business relationship, our friendship right now. Uh, before we end anything, we'll get you started. Uh, again, welcome. Uh, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, again, this is Podcast 485. This is the Crushing Iron Podcast. We come to you twice a week, traditionally, on Mondays and Thursdays, but always twice a week. We have uh, for the last five years. Uh, Mike does a really awesome job of highlighting and outlining all of the um, topics we go through in all the podcasts. You can go back and start number one. You can just pick and choose whatever you think applies for your daily life and go through those. Or you can go in reverse order. You can reverse negative split and start now and go back to the beginning when we sucked. And now we're just kind of happily mediocre. Um, but as uh, as coaches and athletes ourselves, we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about life, about what we're going through personally, about what our athletes are going through. We talk about uh, race recaps, race previews. I uh, have on the very rare guest, uh, but for the most part, we uh, we just kind of talk about why we aren't professionals, why we aren't experts. We are still trying to figure it out, and uh, we're still trying to figure out why we listen to Mike about where to get your hair cut. Um, but that's what we do. We have an open house discussion. We have no agenda. We have no ads. Um, we have one. Well, we have, yeah, we do have an agenda to keep you happy and healthy. But other than that, uh, we just sit back, relax, and hopefully you enjoy some of our triathlon-related banter today. You looked at me the other day and you go, hey, I got an important question. <laughs> it was yesterday. No, it was yesterday. Monday. It was Monday. 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 It was like, yeah. uh, I know. And you did the swivel. It was a hesitation when before you asked because you knew. I knew what I was, I was asking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So where do you get your hair cut? Because yes. your, your stylist was out of town for the week. Yeah. And, so uh, I, so, you know, Mike and I have been best friends for seven, eight years now. I've been working on there for five or six. And I, he has this thing where. He doesn't, he's territorial about who, and we can call him stylists, but people that have seen us know that we don't get our hair styled. So you can call him whatever you want to, um, stylist or whatever. But, you know, Mike is very particular about not sharing whoever does his haircut. He, he's like very mum is the word. Like I have, I didn't have no idea he's ever cut your hair ever because he just won't tell me. <laughs> and so I was supposed I to have go, a we have a, we have a, uh, we have camp coming up here starting tonight. We have our technical camp. We'll have uh, 20 athletes coming in town from all over the country. Uh, invading the hub for the next uh, four days, but I was uh, haven't gotten a haircut in like five weeks, and I was getting a little shaggy, and I knew it I, I knew I needed to kind of you know be a little at least a little more presentable. Um, and I but I know how you are, so I had a, a haircut scheduled for for Tuesday morning, seven a.m. bright and early, um, which is my favorite spot because they can't be running late, right? Seven a.m. It's like you're not going to get behind. Like I need it right on the dot, seven o'clock. Um, and my girl Frankie over at Frankie and Johnny is off of a Barton, which is actually on the Ironman Chattanooga run course. Um, she texted and she was like, dude, I, uh, I, I can't make it. I'm stuck in Tybee Island. Uh, the trucks broke down. I can't make it. Uh, do you have anything available? You know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm like, I can't, I'm doing, I'm doing camp. Um, and so I kind of found myself in a pickle. Like, do I look, do I look ragged and, and disheveled and, uh, unkept? Which is what I think. I, how, you're I think how I usually look at going for the an crunch. Ultra runner, yeah, that's going to really be flat belt. Like I'm going all trails. Yeah, I'm going man. all trails. Got my belt buckle, my uh, my handheld. And I, and so, so I knew I needed some help, and so I, I did. I, I I sat there in front of my computer for like five minutes. And I was like, oh, God, should I ask him this or should I not? Because like things are going really well. You know, we're best friends. Our business is going great. Like, do I really? That really broached this subject, which is a you know a sensitive subject. So I got up the nerve and I, I, I leaned over and I was like, Hey, man, I got to ask you an important question. You know, we, we, our backs face each other. We, I faced the window, he faced the other wall, and he kind of did this like slow mo swivel around in his chair, and he picked up his glasses and he put them on, and he crossed his leg. And he goes, and he could tell he was like, a, there was like a hesitation, like he was like, this is gonna be big. And he said, yeah, man. I go, I need to know where you get your hair cut. And it took him back. He like leaned back in his chair, and he was, I think, I could tell he thought about it for a minute. And then he asked me what my reasoning was because he, I think he, wa- I think he wanted to make sure that I wasn't gonna like go fun. And I explained my situation. I was like, "Listen, I'm, d- I'm in a pickle here. I need, I need some help. Where do you go?" And I, th- for a second there, I thought you were gonna do me wrong. Like you're at the bar and like someone asked for a number and you're like, "Oh, for sure, here it is. It's like nine three one one two three four five six seven. Like you're gonna give me like the wrong person like to go to and be like, "Hey, I know Mike Torali. He comes here." And, and then I get there in the chair and they're like, "We've never heard of him before." And I'm like, "He got me. He told me." So, but you, you fessed up. You told me where you went. I booked my appointment. And I went I, before I even get into the haircut review. 
uh, and then we go into the actual meat of the podcast. Um, I just want to appreciate you um, sharing that secret with me. I, w- I won't say where it was because I don't want anybody else going there either and, and taking your thunder. I'll respect the, your, your haircut and your stylist anonymity. Okay. I'll put a note in the, in the podcast <laughs> as to when it actually starts. So if you're getting frustrated, you can look. But anyway, um, the reason I'm hesitant about sharing that is because I look at sort of a stylist as a it's kind of a therapist. Oh, you're a talker? Well, every when you once get your in a while, cut? you know, you get relaxed, you get the massage scalp thing, and then, and then it's like, then you're starting to share shit that, you know, you might not normally share. And then if you're in the same chair with the same person and stuff slides out of her mouth, and it would be like, you could be getting, you know, so like, you, you won't talk- recommend your own therapist to somebody. So do like, you, if we went to the same therapist, that would be bad. So you do you talk about me at your, like, are you afraid they're going to say something about me that you've no, been talking about No, it isn't about, about you. It's, you know, just stuff maybe that, you know, I might tell her, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I can assure you after my experience yesterday, I'm not going back. Good. All yeah. Right. My haircut, I would rate it a five out of 10. Well, you didn't go to my style. No, I didn't. And uh, I'm sure you called ahead and was like, hey, my buddy's calling ahead. Please tell him you're booked. Like the oh, next, man. you know, makes you. So I went in there and I got the, it's, it's, I would say it's a five out of 10. Um, I like just, it. I was not impressed. If Frankie, like when it settles, when the, when it, there's no settling. settling. Here's my biggest it's pet like peeve. The shoe will fit better when you leave we'll the store we'll later move, a few days. We'll move on to the meat of the podcast and we will talk about triathlon and things in life that pertain to, uh, to the rest of you probably but my biggest pet peeve is if when you're going to cut somebody's hair you either brush it from their face or you blow dry constantly like you get it off their face this quote-unquote stylist basically treat like i looked like cousin it like all the hair came off the top of my head and covered my entire face i thought i had like my grown up my beard again and at one point, I was like, can you just stop for a second? I need, to, I need to, like, wipe my face clean. So I took both hands up and, like, brushed off all the hair from my face. And then she got out um, her blow dryer and put it on, like, the zero setting and, like, misted. You know, it was like it had the the breath of, like, three fairies on my face and just slightly dusted it off. And I was like, this didn't. This just moved the hair. It didn't remove it. It just moved around my face. Got out. She was like, you want to take my car? And I'm like, fine. Let me put it in my, my wallet so I can throw it away when I get to back to the hub. And I walked back in the hub to wash my face. My ears were covered in the hair. Biggest pet peeve. Always remove the hair. It, it's, just, it's just a standard. All right. Anyway. If you're getting frustrated and upset with this, we're sorry. But <laughs> listen, it's, you know, it's, everyone it's, else goes this. You, 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 you find a good person who does your haircut. And I'm sure we're losing listeners right now. But that's whatever. what I mean. If they're getting, not you, but I mean, like, if you're getting mad about this, I, again, I. It's I, a life thing. You find a, a good thing. stylist and you stick with them. So I'm going to, I already, I came, I sat back down to my chair. And the first thing I did. Book a ne- book book a session with Frankie for next Saturday. Yeah, that's good. My well, hair is barely going to move, and I was like, I'm I'm fixing this right now. Step number one to a good race: sweet haircut. <laughs> it's just, it's just, seriously, here sweet we go haircut. right into the topic. The right meat. into the topic. So let's go right into the topic now. Before we do, uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram: c twenty six underscore triathlon. We have a lot of awesome content on there. Uh, we have more uh, things on our website that aren't related to haircuts, but more related to triathlon, all things we do with our community, our camps, and our coaching, and that is c26triathlon.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and also you're looking for reviews. a coach, I'd be happy to help guide you into yeah. your late season race. Yeah, just don't ask him for Crushing a pre-race iron haircut. Email. I'll share, I'll share with, with out-of-towners. My, yeah. Uh, no, you, yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I got a topic for you. Do you have one? Because you uh, seem kind of salty before we started. Oh, I'm salty. I know. So you have a topic or you mean go with mine? No topic. I'm just salty. Okay. Well, we can deal with that. Um, I want to talk about, and I want to talk about this Monday before you get me riled up talking about swimming, was the impact of heat, humidity, and dew point on your training. This is something that we we touched on a little bit before, and I think we touch on it every year, but I think it it is a, it needs to be, everyone needs to be reminded of it this time of year because so many things happen with, and you see us in all different parts of the country, like I know up in like our athletes that are in Minnesota, Wisconsin right now, like they have a giant heat wave going on. And there's like a couple of things, a couple of directions we can go, but a couple of things I want to highlight. One is just how you should train in the heat, how often you should train in the heat, uh, the kind of fueling and nutrition you need to pay attention to when training in the heat. And do you need to, you know, cause what, here's what happens. We talk about this all the time. Like athletes like to go to the extreme. They like to, you know, I got a, I got a hot race coming up center. So I think I'm going to just specifically go out in the hottest part of the day and do all my runs, or I'm going to hop on the trainer with no fan. I'm going to do a treadmill run in my garage with the heater going on. And they feel like that's going to make them a much better athlete every single time. And it's not. Um, then you have athletes who are married 
like married and obsessed with their heart rate and are, are wondering how they're going to actually hit their quote unquote heart rate zones this time of year when you can't walk outside at two o'clock without and go to your mailbox without being in zone three. And then they're wondering <laughs> like, how am I supposed to do my, my MOF or, you know, my MOF heart rate, you know, like when it wants to keep you like super low. I'm like, you can't like, you have to run by feel and you have to be smart about it. And you see, People just really, really, really struggling this time of year with the fact that it, it's basically gone from like, you know, fairly chill. Like we've been in Chattanooga, obviously, this whole time. And it, the hottest day we've had in the last month and a half was race day. It's been like cool, not cool, but it's been, it hasn't been that hot ever since, but it's about to get hot. And it's not just the heat that gets you, it's the humidity and the dew point. So I think, as always, it's a great topic to cover. It's a good reminder, um, you know, for athletes that are, that are panicking and stressing. Uh, about quote unquote losing their fitness because you know they can't run the same or bike the same uh, their rpe is different in the heat of the summer you gotta fuel differently you just you gotta start paying attention you, you can't just walk out the door like we discussed on our zoom last week like you could wake up on a on a nice perfectly cool you know um you know cloudy cloudy day in february and go probably run an hour and a half with like nothing but water or even if water you can't even do that for like 30 minutes right now if you want to like actually feel decent when the day is over with. So you got to start paying attention. You got to start um, recognizing that your paces aren't going to be probably as, not probably aren't going to be as fast. Your RPE is going to be high. Your recovery is going to take longer. It's all different and it's all, and it's all, um, it's all changing right now for athletes, which, which is also, I think a lot of why people are struggling because now you're getting closer races and you put all this work in, hopefully November, December, January, February, March, April, the weather's basically perfect, right? You've gotten in pretty good shape and now all of a sudden you're starting to either see your times quote unquote slow some, even though they're, you know, they might look sore on paper, the effort is still there. Um, or for a lot of people, it's just the RP is so much higher to go out and run, you know, an eight minute pace. You see that. And that's kind of one of, that's one of the main things I'm looking for in training peaks right now is people who, you know, consistently run in like the eight fifty fifteen 15 to like eight forty range who might not wear heart rate monitors. And I, and I know it's gotten hot there and they're still running in eight fifteen and eight forties. And I'm like, dude, I, I can't tell you, like when you're commenting that your run legs aren't there, I think you're struggling it's because you can't breathe outside. And so I think I want to talk about dew point for sure. Cause at some point there is a negative return on that. So that's where I'm headed today. Mm. You on board? Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally on board. I, Cause I see it all the time too. And it's sort of this uh, fear of losing fitness, like in a week or something. And I do, obviously that's the comment you, you start to see a lot more at this time of the year. And, and I love that you, you know, you talk about your RPE feels different and your recovery time is different. And it's just, like preparing for these kind of things. And I, I, you know, it's like you walk out the door here now in, in the summer in Chattanooga and it's probably that way everywhere, but like, it just feels like you get hit by a brick and, and it's like a different animal. And I think it has a lot to do with uh, what you've been doing a few hours before that. So I think a lot of people get up and they might be dehydrated or whatever. And then they just go outside and do try and do the run, even in the morning when it's hot, but like, you know, like, or drink coffee or something. I mean, that, I, that just, that's just how I am. I feel like I do that and I feel like that matters. <laughs> like if I drink a big cup of hot coffee and then I go outside and then it's like, why am I, why am I so hot? Well, you know, maybe you should have an ice glass of ice water. And it's not so much even the heat. It is the humidity and the dew point that absolutely wreck people. It's how much condensation is in the air. It's in most people would say this, like if you look at charts in terms of like, you know, the because the, the dew point is what kills people. And right now the dew point is absolutely crazy in certain parts of the country. Like we, I, we have a ton of athletes in Texas, Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, all over. And, and they've all commented in the last last four or five days, the dew point there, because believe me, they send me screenshots to justify is they have dew point at like 75, 76, 78, which is which in any chart you look at in terms of like looking at um, humidity and dew point when it comes to ideal conditions, they'll basically say like 55 to 60 degree dew point is, um, you know, I think below 60 is like ideal race conditions. 60 to 65, expect, um, you know, your performance to slightly suffer. That's 60 to 65, expect your performance to slightly suffer. Okay, so you're already looking at slowing your pace down. 65 to 70, it says your performance will be impacted greatly. Your, hear me out. Your per, 65 to 70, your performance will be impacted greatly. That's, that's not like, ah, well, you might feel a little bit tired. That is, you're going to be significantly slower with a much higher RP. And then it says 70 or above, 
either don't train outside, right? Or don't do any speed work at all, period. Or find a treadmill. And then, then anything over 75, it basically says any running outside is basically counterproductive because you should be doing it inside because it's so hard to get any kind of a work in because you, you just can't breathe. Then you're going to be more sore the next day because you can't get oxygen. Those are things you have to look for this time of year and you have to start thinking through. Like, because listen, like, at, triathletes in general are like when it comes to going all in or going all out or buying the next gadget or doing the new thing or going to extreme or being extra soft, like triathletes are like blindfolded with all those options swinging at a pinata. Like one day they're one thing, one day they're not one day. It's like, I I think I want to be in like my, you know, controlled pain cave with my, you know, my Fiji water that's, you know, crystallized from the, you know, nearby waterfall. And I've got five fans blowing on me and I've got my ERG mode and I've got, you know, Zwift up. I got Trina Road up. I also got my favorite Netflix series up. like four flat screens and perfect control. And then a week later, they're like, dude, I got this race coming up in October. It's probably gonna be hot. No fan. Okay. No fan at all. And then I'm gonna go run on the track at like 1230 every day. And then you wonder why, A, you're not getting better. Because listen, like if you're like people and people have this like obsession with hills and heat that in order to do well at both, you have to only do both. But the fact of the matter is, is that fitness and being able to perform well is the number one indicator on how you're going to do well in heat. If you take a person and we same thing with hills. It's the fitter you are. It's not. It's not that your body. Yes, there's, or is there is there a different you know uh, style and, and technique that goes into climbing hills? Sure, but guess who's gonna cl- guess who's gonna make up the hill fastest? The guy who's fitter and stronger and faster. Not the person who only did hill repeats for the whole entire year. Like if that person's generally still slower, he's still not gonna be faster than the person who's just incredibly fit and trains right away. In order to get really good quality workouts this time of year, you're Honestly, you're more than likely going to have to go inside for some of it if you really want to be able to, because you can't breathe. That's why I get on athletes so, so much in the wintertime that are doing like their hard trainer, like high intervals, zone three, zone four, zone five, on the trainer with no fan and a long sleeve shirt on because they think, they think they're going to lose weight from it. Like, well, are you weight loss oriented or are you performance oriented? Because if you're before, performance oriented, you're not going to be able to push as hard on the bike inside with, with none of those things going as you will. So, and the point is to elicit a response from your body to get faster by going o- over and above what it's currently able to handle. That's how you get better. And right now you have to be just very, very smart with how you go about that. I, I'm a huge advocate this time of year, like mid, mid to late June, early parts of July, where I could really, if you have to be outside, just kind of reining your run in a little bit, just kind of getting yourself adapted to the fact that it's insanely hot right now, mm-hmm. not expecting to go out and run mile repeats because after your first one, you're going to be done. Like, you're going to be done. You can't, you won't be, again, people see us all the time. I've seen, I saw it through training peaks, saw it in my own run last Sunday morning, leaving for my mom's house. For the first mile or two, you're like, this isn't really that bad. Like, I can breathe okay. It's not too bad. It's not hot. But once the humidity in the condensation in the air catches up with you, you're not able to, get everything that you need as much oxygen in your muscles. You like, it's almost like in like a split second, you're like, I feel really labored. My legs feel like rocks. This isn't fun anymore. You got to start super slow. And if you want to do quality sessions, you're probably going to hit the treadmill, but it's also again, a great time to do maybe a couple extra, not a couple extra, maybe one or two extra harder bike sessions indoors during the week where you're not going to be overly stressed. But as with all things, as with all training, it is about me- measuring and managing one thing. And that is stress. And heat and the, how hot it is and the dew point and the humidity all impacts your stress. And that's why so many people right now are becoming so overstressed right now because they are trying to do too much when their body hasn't had the time to adapt to much harsher and more extreme conditions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that goes along with this idea of, of wanting to lose weight with, you know, all that sweating and all that year. kind of Because your body, is, when it's stressed, it starts, you know, conserving like fat and it's, it starts surviving mode, you know? So I think that if you're going to push yourself and deplete yourself, that's like, it's like not sleeping well or something like that. You know, like I always say that I think one of the main reasons that, you know, there's an obesity problem in the country a lot of times comes back to people don't sleep well and they don't recover well. So then they're all of a sudden craving 
carbs and sugars and they just like oh it's a wicked cycle that you know doesn't allow them deep sleep and then they're eating and whatever so i think there's a lot it's similarities in there or something like that you know my thing is like i like working out when it's hot but like like you're saying my last few work is i rode yesterday and I, I think my average mile per hour on the green or the bikeway was like 13.6 miles an hour on the bike mm-hmm. and i thought it was a spectacular workout because of that reason yeah it just i rode over it was a long ride because my whole thing right now is about building saddle time building volume and i really enjoyed it and i wasn't absolutely wiped out that's a win for me you know so i'm going to be talking about at the tech camp kind of you know race day confidence and training with purpose and those are the kind of things that i want to work in there is you find out you know sort of what your weakness is and for me it's like uh the volume stuff a lot of times so i've been uh just figuring out ways to, because I like just, I just like being outside, you know, in general and riding around. And even though it was super hot and dew pointy and all that kind of stuff, I just liked just getting out there and, and not pushing it, but like spending time, you know, spending that time. Because that, the, like, normally for me to go out and just do a two hour easy ride is like, forget it. It's not going to happen, especially when I, when I used to go to the lab, you know, and I just throw down. <laughs> Well, yeah, we're we're all out of lab shape right now. Hopefully, we can get back some lab shape in three weeks. But one of like one of the biggest things we see this time of year, and this is something I tell a lot of athletes. I this I said this on a conversation with an athlete yesterday, well, on our phone call was that like for the for the amount of volume that most people train, it you're not going to get overtrained. Like most ninety nine points ninety nine point nine percent of the populations problem isn't ever going to be overtraining it's going to be under recovering like like it, your body can handle so much it can handle so much training if you're recovering the right way if you are fueling well if you are pacing right if you are doing all the things you need to be to be able to and you're you're doing the right intensity you're not just trying to smash yourself so most of you aren't overtrained you're just under recovered going to your sleep um you know it's always like you have to get sleep you have to fuel right you have to eat right you have to space out the, 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 the sessions the correct way. You can't just be smashing yourself day in and day out. Right now, so many people are smashing themselves in every workout by going out in the hottest part of the day. I, I got to get heat acclimated. Well, this is also a great way to run yourself into the ground like by, because you're going to be so sore and so overstressed by doing so much because your 40-minute run isn't going to feel like a 40-minute run anymore. If you're not adapted to the heat, if you've been doing 60s and 70s and you go out, you're going to feel shelled, and you're going to wake up the next day and do another session the same way, you're going to be shelled again. It's about managing stress, and it's about taking care of yourself. So, you know, when I read athletes, like, yeah, this just went really bad, or my legs went, or well, your legs went with your ego, because your ego walked out the door and said, well, I usually run in the 830s. You know, who cares if the humidity is 98%? Who cares if the dew point 76? Who cares if it's 95 degrees and all I've had the day is, you know, three almonds, a Tic Tac, and a raisin? Like, I should still be doing 830s. And you go out and you run 830s, and after two miles, you're like, I can't do this anymore. I have to quit, and I have to stop, and I have to walk. Your run legs didn't go anywhere. Your decision-making showed up. And that is, like, this is the time of year where decision-making is is key. It's going to ruin your workout. It are going to make your workout. And it's where you have, if you, ha- if you aren't checking your own ego before you head out the door, before you get on your bike, before you get in the swimmer, even if you're getting in the outdoor pool, like this is something that people just like fail to recognize every year when the outdoor pools open up and they go out and swim at noon. I'm like, you do realize that it's, you're still breathing the same air, right? It's when you go run or when you go ride. Like, in fact, it's even harder. So if you're going to head out in the outdoor pool and swim when it's 85 degrees and high humidity, it's going to feel so terrible. Not to mention the water's probably going to be warmer than what you're normal. Like, you're going to be slower. That's just how it's going to be. So you you can either check your ego at the door and just, you know, relinquish the fact that you should go by what things feel like and not by what things look like in terms of effort or the weather is going to check it for you. And you're in, in what happens is, is if you, if you check it, then you're probably gonna be able to, you know, make it through the entire week, getting all your sessions and you're probably gonna feel pretty good. Like you said, your ride yesterday, you know, checked your ego, went out, just got some good style time in. It was pretty hot, but you, you, you got done feeling like that wasn't bad. Like I feel pretty good. You look pretty good. You look good today. Look ready to roll. You did that, right? So you're still on, you're still in control, ready to roll this week. If the weather makes a decision for you, the next day is going to suck, right? Or you go out and you, and because I've, I've had a lot of athletes who, 
you know, they rode longer road or, or ran hard this weekend and it was too hot and they underfueled. They're just now, uh, some of them even come and say like, it's probably going to take them another day or two. So to get back what the, the hole that they dug by obsessing over a pace or a power and, and also not fueling, like they're going to have, like they're still digging themselves out of that hole. So the one workout you thought was going to be great ended up being way too much. And the next four workouts have suffered. So you have to continue to look at things that way, how they all connect, how they all overlap, how they complement each other. Cause if you make the decision, you can stay in control of that. If you let the weather make the decision and you kind of get, you kind of bonk or you get kind of slapped in the slapped in the mouth. Um, it's going to take you some time to kind of get back. And it's going to be discouraging and frustrating. Yeah. That, that really dovetails perfectly into the question I've been getting a lot um, because a lot of people haven't raced in a long time and they may have a half coming up in a few weeks or something like that and a lot of people are asking can I slide in a sprint or an Olympic in the next you know two weeks out three weeks out and everything like that and my gut is saying you know I know you want to race and I don't want to disrupt that and if it's something you really really want to do you know go for it but to your point and what we've been talking about here, I think ultimately that's the reason because you're going to go out there and just lay it down in most likely super hot weather and you could be shelled for the next week and that could be a critical week for your race, come the, your A race, if it's your half or whatever. So why risk that? You know, because I honestly, I think we really underestimate sprints and Olympics, especially if we start doing a, you know, fulls and halves all the time. And then I was like, ah, I'm not just throwing an Olympic real quick. You can get absolutely shelled from an Olympic if you're not in the right spot for it. Or yeah. a sprint. I mean, or like, I've, super I've been, hot. like, you know, for three like... or four days afterwards, I'm limping because you're not. Usually you run harder than you normally would and bike harder. The whole thing, you go harder. And if you're not, like, peppered up for that, you know, it could really come back to haunt you. I mean, not, like, haunt you. But you know what I'm saying? is like you may end up losing three or four really kind of important days for a big race that you got coming up in two weeks and that's preach ultimately what it is preach like that is like the like that's the biggest thing that athletes have a trouble like wrapping their their brain around right now is that because i mean listen like you know people in general right we have this be a hero mentality like i'm gonna i'm gonna do it today like today you know throw all caution to the wind but today i'm just gonna smash it and it might feel good in the moment but guess what the next like you said the next three or four days you ain't going to be a hero. You're going to be a zero, right? It's either going to be a zero workouts done, zero uh, things accomplished. It, it, it's that obsession with like throwing against, it's, it's being impulsive. It's having your ego. It's like all those things. So you can either just this, because listen, do we all have an ego, right? I'm not saying like you have an ego. I have an ego. We, every single person on this planet has an ego, but you want, you want to know what feels better? Me recognizing that I have one and being like, you know what? I'm going to take my ego helmet off today and I put it on the side. I'm not going to use it. You know what? You know what sucks is having it taken from me, right? <laughs> having it taken from me during a, during a session, or waking up the next day and being like, "I knew I effed up." Told you, I knew you effed up. Like you did it anyway, and you messed up the four or five days. Like, and heat does that to you, right? And that's like that's when people become. And I think it's hard to wrap your brain around. I think you know, for athletes who have been in the sport for, or that are newer to the sport, again going back to like the hills and the heat and the fitness thing is like. The, the purpose is to get better, right? It's to do things and participate in training and construct a program and be a part of a process that makes you better. Crushing yourself every day doesn't make you better. It only crushes yourself, right? You have to do things, like things don't need to feel easy as pie, but things should feel, like you said, good. Like I did an hour and 40, 45 minute ride today and every ounce of my being wanted to ride for another hour and 15 minutes for three hours and smash it because I felt good this today? morning. Yeah. I did already rode today and yesterday. Yeah. I told you I'm feeling oh, he's back. back, baby. Um, but every ounce of my being to wrap this up. I got to go run. Was <laughs> felt like, dude, just do it, man. Just go. Like you got it today. You got it today. Cause I did a pretty hard bike workout yesterday Yeah, and I, I didn't think I was gonna have these legs. I'm like, you got the leg, just do it. But I didn't, I stopped. And I thought, you know, well, you know why you feel good today? It's because you did what you're supposed to do yesterday. And why you're going to feel good tomorrow is because you're supposed to do today. Like, but we get so caught up in right now that we don't think about then and after that. And then that's, that's the part of getting better and like going out and, and like, yes, is there a time and a place and 
good reasoning behind putting yourselves in situation, putting ourselves in situations that aren't comfortable, right? That aren't ideal conditions. Yes. But at the same time, like you're not, those are good for the experience. They're not, they're not good general for overall fitness. Like, Oh, you want to get heat acclimated? Then don't go out and run in 110 degree heat because the return on investment is nil. The point is to get faster and you can't get faster unless you do workouts that actually provide a stimulus that are fitness induced, not, oh my God, I'm trying to move one foot in front of the other and not die, right? You can either, you, what you can do right this time of year is you can either be a 200 watt, a 200 watt guy and a 10 minute girl and decide, I'm just going to be that person. But now I want to be, I want to be my 200 watt guy or my 10 minute pace girl. And I'm just going to be heat acclimated for those people. I'm not worried about getting fitter. I just want to get heat acclimated. So I'm going to go out and do my two, two watt rides in the, in the burning hot lava sun. And I'm going to do my 10 minute pace on the hilliest, hottest train and feel like absolute trash when I get done. But I'm getting heat acclimated, baby. Garmin says I'm 93.6% heat acclimated. Like your effing watch knows if you're heat acclimated or not. And you can do that. If that's your, if that's your program you're going to work with, then fine. Or you can be like, you know what? I need to get faster wait, that's what we're all doing this for is to get faster. You didn't sign up to, to race, but you know what? I want to do Ironman because I want to be heat acclimated. No, you signed up because you want to get fitter and faster. And what that means is doing workouts in an environment that allow you to get fitter and faster. Now, can, do you always need to be in this safe, controlled environment? No, but you need to expose yourself. Yes, you need to get out and run in the heat, but the person who's gonna who was on an 11-minute mile and did things outside occasionally and kind of got heat acclimated in the last month leading up to their race, but also did quality sessions inside or in a, or in a good environment under smart conditions, dropped down to an 8.30, 8.45-minute mile. Well, guess who's going to win that battle? The 8.45 person who's done some heat training but it's eight, that runs at 8.45 regular versus the 10-minute person? 8.45, they all day, baby. Like, like fitness is fitness. Like, it's it's one of those things where, yes, it translates, but you, ha- like you have to have both. You can't just be, well, I just need to get better hills, so I'm just going to only do hills. No, you have to be overall. Like, you have to be fitter in order to get up hills. Like that, and that's about power. It's about output. It's about watts per kilogram. It's about all those things. It's not about how you sit on your bike. It's about the power that comes out of your legs and the lungs and what they can produce out of your chest. All right. That works for me, man. It doesn't. Yeah. No. uh, There's a happy medium. It's it's not just like extremes all the time. Like that's not, that's not how you get better. Yeah. No, I agree. I I keep thinking about some kind of an analogy because I, I, it's really this, I, I I just want to reiterate one more time that I just, can't get over the fact that um we act like sprints aren't like anything at all like or or olympics or i mean it's sort of like uh you know if uh if a full iron man is kind of like spending seven rounds in the gym with a retired local boxer you know a sprint might be like one round with tyson it could (laughs) really get ugly right you know what i mean quickly quickly and so I just think we need to kind of like a lot of people need to shift their perspective on that. I, I just and I, I've, the re, I've been through it because the, whenever you do an Ironman, you're kind of like just kind of eh, you flip your hand at the sprints. It's no big deal. But man, it's all relative. And that's what you're getting at is like everything's relative. Like if you're going to go out in like ridiculously hot conditions and try to be at your fastest, you're just going to wreck your soul half the time. And uh That's what I say. I was like, I like, I mean, one of the things I think about when I run on a hot day is like just managing that uh, temperature control. Like I I know that what I can, I like, I'll feel if I'm getting too hot and that's when I try to back down or I definitely try to cool off at fountains or whatever. I just try to keep that sort of marginal middle ground of, and I think to me that's heat training in a sense where, you know, because it, it's it's learning how to respect your body and, and understand your body on the race course, you know, because I've done it before where you get out in a race and you're like, wow, man, I feel great. And then like one mile in and you're just absolutely like, you know, someone just poured hot coals on you. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have to really be aware of that, um, you know, and I was even going to get into like, you know, if you are going to go out and run in heat and you're just sort of like getting up from your desk and running out there. Um, I think it's smart to like warm up a little because you want to get your systems like organized and you always call it, you know, like take a, what do you call that? A systems check yeah, kind of thing. Your I check. think if you kind of move around and get a little bit of like, you know, blood flow going, I think everything's going to work a little bit better in the heat. I still go back to this. We, 
when we had Chattanooga here, it was that hot day. It was the chat 70.3. That morning, I had, like, we slept in a super cold hotel room, and, and I was drinking a little water that morning. I was freezing for, like, the first two hours of that morning until the sun came up. And then I just remember, because it was so hot, I was walking, you know, I walk around all over the place with that backpack on and getting those selfies, whatever. Baby. And I go, and I go, and I go, and I was walking. I don't remember getting that hot that day. So, I mean, it was just sort of like I set a tone early on in the day where like I had sort of kept my core. I know I wasn't running, but I was still hiking up hills and going all over the place. But I just think there's some, I, I just want to throw that out. Cause a lot of times people can, you know, understand something a little different, but I, I think there's a lot to be said for prep for whatever run or training you're going to do, you know, like just to set yourself up, whether it's eat the right foods or eat the right time or, you know, make sure you have enough, hydration if you don't go out there dehydrated in the morning because that's going to be like i think that'll come back to bite you you know they always say get some water in you right away because you haven't you've been breathing it you know drying out your whole system for eight to ten hours the uh, i remember like i think it's like two years ago maybe a year ago i was reading i was doing some research on heat acclimation or the because there's so much more research now about training in the heat and how it's similar and sometimes even better than training at altitude. Um, and they elicit the same response. And I remember coming across an article by Alex Hutchinson, who does, he's like the sweat science guy, incredibly brilliant guy, way smarter than me. I think he has like a PhD, which is three letters more than I have after my name. All I got is a junior. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he, they were doing on heat stroke. They did like a, the Nike project, like project one or whatever. That's the guys like they did like a, um, a study on like heat because they're trying to figure out the best time of year, the best place, the best conditions, obviously they can break two hours in the marathon. And what they found was, is that running faster got you there quicker over shorter distances. Right. So you're actually like, to, and to actually like have like a heat stroke or get in like the danger zone of like, you know, um, you know, it, the, getting the chills and just having overall like a really bad situation going on with heat stroke it was they found that it was more likely to happen at 5k and 10k than it was at a half or a full marathon um oh, and then the reasoning the reasoning is one obviously the faster you're moving the more heat you're generating right and then you're going so fast and you're you're not doing what we always advocate which is you're not doing a systems check so by the time your body is trying to communicate with you that things are going poorly they've been going poorly and it's over and you can get yourself in a really, really, really bad situation versus because your body gets so hot so quick that it's just, it's done. You're over with versus a half marathon or a marathon. You're conserving your, no matter what pace or effort you run, no matter what speed it is to you, it's the same effort and same percentage. The delay is so much longer. You'll have those warning signs of, Oh, okay. Maybe I need to rein things back in. Like this isn't going very well because you're not putting, you're not exhibiting, you're not putting out as much heat because you're not going as fast as you normally could, and you're already pacing it differently. You have more time to get in more water, more fluids versus like coming out of the gate and like just absolutely trying to demolish it. That's what people do right now, right? They head out, they head out the gate, and they just absolutely just go for broke or they make bad decisions. And before it's over, it was over before it was over. Like it was over ten minutes, or you just didn't know it yet. Like that, that is always what happens this time of year. Because there is, there is no, we use this, you know, in terms of like pacing and effort and injury expenditure in the marathon. And we talked about it before Chattanooga 70.3 was the only way to, to cool your core temp is to walk. There is no running and cooling at the same time. Like you can, you can mitigate the damage and the amount of stress and you can try to keep it slightly under control. But in order to lower it, you're going to have to walk, baby. And by walking, you're negating every single bit of speed that you took because even walking for one minute, two minutes, three minutes after running for 10 miles is the change of pace of like 15 to 20 seconds per mile that you could have just like, you know, chilled and be able to, and now you're going to have to walk the rest of the time. You're not going to just cool yourself. You're going to go right back up again and right back up again. Your heart's going to spike right back up again. So like, those are all these things that you have to be aware of this time of year. And, and to be, to be honest with you, that's why I also think, and it was maybe, maybe counter <clears throat> intuitive, but that's why I also think this is such a great time of year for people to like rekindle their spirit and their motivation to get out and train because you already have this like overarching theme of, I know it's not going to be pretty. I know it's going to be ugly. I know I'm going to have to go super, 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 super slow because it's so hot. 
So you're not walking out the door with these expectations that are, well, I used to run, you know, like in the eights. Now I'm in the nines. I've got to chase it. It's like, dude, it's hot. Like it is straight brutal outside right now for so many people with the humidity and the dew point. It is impossible to run your best. Like I think, like wrap your mind around that for a second. It's impossible to run your best, to bike your best with the humidity over 90 and the dew point over 65. It's not going to happen. So walking out the door with expectations that are based on perfect conditions are only doing you harm. Same thing goes for obsessing over what your wrist heart rate data says because you've got to stay in your MOF zone or your heart rate zone. Like, good luck running this season <laughs> because you're not. You're going to be walking. Like, you're generally going to just be walking because it's going to be so hot, you're not going to be able to put one foot in front of the other. So you just have to think about it and be smart about it. But, you know, we, we listen, at this day and age, we're creating more and more and more and more athletes who don't want to think about it. They just want to do it you know, mm-hmm. or have it set out in front of them and have things where we don't have to think or troubleshoot. We want it laid out, and that's just not the case. Yeah. That, that just makes me want to reiterate the thing that I always talk about with uh, the, t- the time, like warming up and getting your body ready to do what it's going to do because, like, if you just jump in somewhere cold and, and – use the actual race as the warm up, for example. So it comes back to, for me, uh, some of my better races, uh, the, the, the idea of warming up a lot before you swim, because if you get in, that's the one place you can go from like serious zero to one ten in like one minute because you're freaked out or whatever the case may be. But if you're already halfway up there and you're warmed up and your engine's ready to go a little bit more, you're not going to get that extreme anxiety press that I think happens naturally in the body. It's like, Oh, what are you doing to me right now? I was just chilling on the side talking to your friend. And now all of a sudden I'm at like a 110%. And then the other one is off the bike. I mean, cause I think once you get on the bike, you know, you can kind of, ch- a lot of people, you know, some people definitely go out too fast. Most of us probably, but you still, you have such a longer time and you have, it's easier to f- hydrate and you can kind of contain yourself a little bit more and you got a long long time so you can adjust or whatever but then if you get off that bike and you're kind of feeling like you just got out of a windy day and then that heat hits but that's why I say is like you're saying is like you can't just come out at your like the your race pace and when it's hot out like your ideal track tri kelp you race pace, go you're gonna slow. get slow like you're like that's but that's what that's so why hard. I, yeah at Armand Chattanooga what are you gonna find our coaches yelling at you slow down right because come like you said like Coming off the bike, you don't realize how hot you are because you got a you know sixteen to twenty two mile an hour fan blowing in your face. That is the wind you're creating by going that miles per hour. And then you get off the bike and you're like, oh my god, I'm like pouring sweat right. And your heart rate, your heart rate, and your core, and your core temper already way up. And you go out those first few miles, and then you're all of a sudden, guess what? Coming out of the gates too hot, literally too hot. Like you have to give it time. Then you see people just. Before they even make it around to the pedestrian bridge a second time, walking, day is done, way too hot because you came out too hot. Like, I've literally never heard a single athlete ever, professional, age group, whatever, say, you know what, man, and it was hot that day, but I think I came out of the gate too slow. I was really able to, you know, I picked it up great the last 10 miles and everybody else was walking, but I think I could have, I think I had to gain another 30 seconds by coming out of the gate a little bit. No, everyone was like, thank God I didn't come out of the gate too hot because I had it at the end when everyone else didn't. And that is, that's playing, that's having confidence that playing the long game. And if you don't want to take it from us because we're not experts and we're not professionals, take it from a guy like Steve Magnus, who is like one of the best running coaches in the world, um, which I always find fascinating. Like, the greatest swim coaches on the planet, right, that deal with the Olympians, they don't wear a heart rate monitor. They don't wear a Garmin device. They either don't wear a watch and go by the wall clock or use a stopwatch on deck. The best running coach on the planet use, like, a clipboard and a stopwatch. They're not running with, like, power on their shoes or obsessing about heart rate or whatever it is. They just run by feel and they go by stress. And he said, uh, and this goes for a lot of people, he said um, just, I think, two or three days ago, I was having this conversation with Megan Rogers, who's in San Antonio, um, he said, a reminder that heart rate is pretty much useless in the Houston summer. This was a run at eight minute pace that I did, yet my heart rate was in zone three and zone four. Why? Heat and humidity. If I went by my heart rate zones, I'd be walking. That's why I tend to go by feel. Data needs context. Don't blindly follow it. And that is like what more and more athletes do right now is just blindly follow 
data or their assum- or their assumption of what the data should be and not thinking it's not even thinking out of the box it's just thinking with like common sense logically that it's it's going to be hotter it's going to be harder on you like that's that's just a fact of the matter um and but people who want to obsess over the you know like, like that's why a lot of people don't get better honestly over the summer because they obsess so much about what their heart rate says that yeah do you want to be having it sky high like 190 the whole time no because that's not gonna you know be good for you either but at the same point they're like i want i can't i can't fathom why i'm not getting any any faster over the summer you know having to walk most of my run wait a minute you're having to walk most of your runs like then go run right just run. even running slowly is better than not running at all like but you're you're uh, you know or you're going off what your garmin says is you know, overtraining or undertraining or what your heat like your watch has like literally no idea who you are. Like it has nothing. Like it don't it, know, it knows pace, it knows distance, it knows time. Don't give your Garmin so much freaking credit. Like that's about all it has. Mm-hmm. I love my Garmin, by the way. Like to, you know, I, I love it, but it's that's all it tells me is it doesn't tell me how I'm feeling. It doesn't like I scoff at it when it's like overreaching. You know, thirty nine hours to recover. I'm like, I can I can go back to the pool right now and I feel great about it. Like yeah. it doesn't it doesn't tell you it's, anything. It's definitely uh, it. Yeah, man, I just, look, thinks back to like when we occasionally will have running off the bike or something like that. And uh, I always tell people that's a really good time to practice kind of containing yourself, you know, rather than getting off and flying for, because it's usually a short run or whatever. And it's like, I always think of that as an opportunity to practice getting off a bike in the beginning of the run and, and whatever that looks like, but just to be cognizant of the idea that, it does take practice to slow down off a bike because you, your legs are flying. And, and like anybody that has never done that, we didn't, you didn't tell them anything. So like we all run or ride for a long time and then get off the bike and say, hey, go run. They'll always go fast, like faster than they normally would at the beginning because you're just warmed up and everything like that. But that's the point. You're warmed up and you're heated up. So you got to kind of like work to kind of control that, you know. Uh, that's another thing I've been doing. I'm, uh, any of my runs outside these days are just all, yeah, my, and you're right. My heart rate is like, it's like a little bit up there or whatever. But uh, the whole thing for me is like just finding it, that pace where I'm breathing through my nose usually or easily. And I feel like I'm just like, I'm, I'm like totally training to find my zone two sweet spot in the conditions. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, totally. it's not about... Anything to do really with pace. I'm not even really looking at my watch that much, but it's funny. I am, though, like over time, I'll glance at it and I'm usually in the same pace, but I feel excellent. So, I'll, you know, a lot of times I'll stop and walk for a minute and just kind of keep it under control and things like that. And then, but I really like this idea of no matter what the temperature is or whatever, you just kind of like listen so much to your body and feel it out and know exactly that you're like in all day sort of pace. And that's it. When you can solidify that, I think you're really doing something. It's, but you have to bridge that gap and have, have a more like your thought press has to be instead of what looks good now, it has to be, what do I think will feel good later? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and I, for you most people, trust the process. Yeah. And you know? like, well, you know, yeah, your, your two mile run off the bike means nothing, right? It means zero. It has nothing to do with how you're going to be on race day. Mm-hmm. You have to run it in, you know, you have to run it and feel it out like, yeah, it might look good right now, but what's going to feel good in 10 (laughs) or 15 miles? Because that's going to matter because what looks good right now don't matter. It doesn't matter at all. If you can't keep it up and you can't keep running like that's in my opinion, that's the only purpose of brick running is to teach you how to slow down. It's not because, you know, brick running is some super special sport. Although I did hear in the summer Olympics in 2028, they're going to introduce brick running. As a sport? Yeah, just total, because it's, it's totally different than regular running. Like, you have to practice it going off the bike. It, brick running is totally different than regular running. So they're going to have a sport where they, they put you up an indoor trainer, and then you're only allowed to run off the bike, because it is so incredibly different from running that you have to practice it four times a week. Wait, so they're not going to include the bike part? No, of course not. Well, it's yeah, they, the, they have to. Yeah, just, you, know I'm being, you know I'm being sarcastic. Oh, <laughs> I didn't He's know. showing dude. his age, like, dude. Sir, I, no, no, dude, there's some crazy sports That's making their way into the Olympics. Is, this is also true. The people are just grasping for straws. No, but it's, it should be to, to learn how to pace yourself conservatively and to rein back because your legs have got, are going so fast and the bike you get off and they just kind of carry you along the way. That's why I think like when I get, when I run off the bike, I practice like what I call my triple shuffle. Like I want to like, I'm like, how much can I slow myself down? Because 
after two miles, it doesn't just kind of, it doesn't kind of like gradually kind of peak its way in. It's like, bam, it's like smacks across the face. You're like, you made a mistake and now you're paying for it. It's not, it's not like a gradual pay for it. It's like a, oh, I made a mistake. And now I'm going to have to pay for it for the next 24 miles or the next 11 miles, however long it is. You're going to pay for it that long versus I'm just going to put this pain and this, these bad decisions off as long as I possibly can and continue to move forward at a responsible and, and well thought out pace. And not effort, more like effort. What do you think you can hold right during? Because you can't, you could race in 60 degrees for one race and 100 degrees in the other, and the approach should be the same. What feels like you can do it, you know, not what you assume or you want. What feels like can be done. Mm. That's interesting because some I've had a few longish runs lately, and I'm not in, in anywhere near race shape or anything like that. But it's so funny how like you can be going, I could do this, and then you're doing it, and then you're like, yeah, pick it up a little bit, and then like within a mile or two miles, your hammies are hurting, your quads are, you know, like your hips are starting to drag. You know, it's like how incredibly patient you have to be with running is unbelievable. Sometimes, I mean, you know, like. It's, it just can, wait for it. (laughs) If you find that place. So that's why, I mean, like most people, like, unless you're, you know, high end, you're going Kona top podium, whatever, you know, that, and even them to, to a degree, but they usually, I just think that they probably understand themselves a lot more. So like for most people, like 80% of anybody doing an Ironman, if you feel good running through, you know, mile 10, just stay there. Don't try anything crazy because it's going to feel bad at some point. You don't want to make it feel bad for 18 or 20 miles. And then you can start to suffer. If you can get to 18 miles and feel pretty good and still like be running, you're winning, man. Golden. 100% golden. Like (laughs) like it's like delaying that feeling, but it all goes back to like, you know, how people train. It's like, I should feel bad all the time. Like I should crush myself every day. No, 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 you shouldn't. Like if it feels good, then it sucks for everybody else. I promise you because we've all been there. But it's like you don't, because eventually, even no matter how well you pace it, at some point, it's going to suck. Yeah. You don't want to make it suck any, any earlier than when it, because once it starts sucking, it's going to really suck. And it, your legs are going to be like rocks. And you're going to walk, want to walk so bad because once you do walk, God, it feels so good. You're not going to want to start running again. Uh, it gets even harder. So just, just be patient. And by all means, and like the most important thing, getting this from this podcast find a good hairstylist and stick with them and, <laughs> and don't go rogue. And, and even if you got to wait it out, wait it out and stick with it. Frankie, if you're listening, you're not, I love you. And I, I regret um, cheating on you as a hairstylist. Confession. Hairstyle confession. It's the new reality series. It is. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll check again next week. Again, if you have any questions about anything and everything, you can reach out to Mike. He is at crushing iron at gmail.com. If you need anything from me, I'm at c26coach at gmail.com. If you want to more, uh, know more things about our coaching, our camps, our community, and even our awesome club program that's going on right now, you can go to our website, c26triathlon.com. Um, our club membership has picked up a lot in the last week or two with races full on. Um, I think all of our coaches, except for myself, have a lot of uh, slots open right now. So reach out, and we'll put you with the right coach. And, uh, hope you next year. All right, buddy, let's get, the, let's get on that tech camp. See ya.